by participating, you are giving your consent. And this presentation will be made available later on our YouTube channel, which is University of Maryland Extension Western Cluster. That's where you can find our, um, our channel. Okay, actually, Ashley, are you able to start the um, recording? Yes, it started. Okay, very good. Then we're gonna move on. Trying to move on. Okay, so our subject today is tea in the garden. And usually this is a class that I do at our extension office because I have a demonstration garden there and I like to take people on tours of that garden. So this is a class where I take you around the garden and show you all the herbal plants I have, um, have some medicinal plants, and then we would actually collect some plant material and make some tea and you'd actually get to try some tea. So um, it's a fun class, but unfortunately with the coronavirus, we can't do it that way. So we're gonna have to do it virtually. Okay, so we always like to let you know who we are. Um, we are part of the University of Maryland. The Master Gardener program is part of the University of Maryland Extension, which in turn is part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources of the University of Maryland. And every state in our union has a, um, a land grant university through which these extension um, offices are, and programming are through. So every county in Maryland or almost every county in Maryland has an extension office. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the history of tea here for a moment. And as you may have guessed, it begins in China. So while our focus today is gonna to be on herbal teas, where the history of tea begins is with the Camellia sinensis plant from the family T the ACI, the ACI. And this plant uh, has, is, grows in the hardiness zones seven through nine. It requires rich, moist, well-drained acidic soil, uh, prefers a bright location that does get some shade. It's native to China. Um, you can apply a balanced fertilizer to it and make sure it gets plenty of water. So in the northern states, you're not going to be able to grow this plant outside year round. Um, if you, you might be able to grow it in a pot and then bring it indoors as long as it gets um, plenty of sunlight and or, or artificial light through the winter. But for the most part, it's only that you can only grow this plant out of doors uh, in the, the southern areas of our country. Okay, now in 2737 BC, Emperor Shenong, whose name means divine farmer, is credited with having discovered tea. So there's a legend that goes along with uh, this, um, this idea and that it is said that the emperor was out with his one of his servants one day in the fall and he had uh, settled down to take some shade under uh, a camellia tree and he asked his servant to prepare some water for him and he would always have the the servant you know prepare the water by boiling it well while the servant was uh, boiling the water some of the leaves that were dried and it was it was in the fall so some of the leaves were falling, they were dead, and they ended up in his pot of boiling water. So when the servant came back, he saw that, but he served it to the emperor. The emperor decided it had a very nice aroma to it and he would try it. So he tasted it and thought that it was really very refreshing. And so then we have, you know, the drinking of tea from the Camellia sinensis plant. That's where it has gotten hit its origins according to um, Chinese lore. Well, the Han Dynasty from 2006 BC to 220 AD then began to use tea um, for its medicinal qualities. And during this time, 
T was not really available to the common people, only for those um, in higher political power or you know, like the emperor, because the tea was expensive. It had to be gathered on the mountaintops and then brought down for the, for the emperor's use. So it wasn't really um, popular at this point among your everyday folks. Then, if we, as we progress in time a little bit, from 618 to 907 AD, which is during the Tang Dynasty, this is the period of time where tea drinking comes to the masses. It becomes an art form for everyone to be enjoyed and uh, to enjoy it. And it was part of the everyday life of your Chinese people. People would gather together to enjoy tea. So it became a staple in everyone's life there. And uh, Buddhist monasteries would often cultivate vast tea fields. They enjoy drinking tea and it is said that the monks enjoy drinking the tea and it helped them to stay awake during meditation. Now from there, how did, how did the tea get from China to Europe? Well, through the trade. And in 1606, the first consignment of tea was shipped from China to Holland by the Portuguese. The Dutch became importers and distributors of, of tea. In fact, they were ahead of the curve on this uh, from the English. And we don't really see mention of tea being um, used as a drink in England until there was, they found an ad in an old paper, 1658. Uh, it was put in there by Thomas Garraway who had a coffee house and he was advertising this new China drink called tea, and that it was gonna be served at his coffee house. And it was touted to improve memory, vanquish heavy dreams and remove lassitude. So I guess in, uh, in common language nowadays, it means it gives you energy and helps you stay awake. I think that's what he was trying to say. So tea then became such a popular drink at this time that actually people were drinking more tea than beer and wine. And this began to concern Charles II because he was lagging behind on his tax revenues from beer and wine. So he started this, um, he imposed a, the first English tea tax ever to kind of make up that shortfall with the beer and wine tax. And this didn't make the, the uh, coffee house owners too happy. So from there, tea makes its way from Europe to North America. And it was Peter Stuyvesant who, who brought the first tea to the colonists in the Dutch settlement, settlement of New Amsterdam. Now, when the Dutch er, handed over um, this province to the English, and the English took over, this province then became known as the colony of New York. And it is said that in the colony of New York, the people who lived there drank more tea than all the people in England. So it was very popular there. And it became very popular uh, in Boston and Philadelphia. So those were the centers of um, tea drinking and distribution. And now we move on to the Revolutionary War. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of the Boston Tea Party in 1773, um, the English, um, imposed a heavy, well, several heavy taxes, and one of them included that on tea. And uh, the colonists didn't like that. They said no taxation without representation. And uh, the English said, well, we're imposing this tax because we need to recoup some of the losses from having to fight the French and Indian War to help protect you all. So you have the Sons of Liberty planned this um, this protest where they dressed up like Native Americans and at night they boarded this English ship and they threw over all of the tea that was being imported by um, the, I forget the name of the company. It's all in all the pirate movies. But anyway, it was uh, thrown overboard as a protest. And of course that enraged the English and it was one of the preambles to the Revolutionary War. 
Okay, so during this time, the ladies of the colonies, who are the ones who are usually buying the tea and preparing it, decided that um, uh, they would show their support of the, of the colonies and the revolutionaries by not buying British teas. And so they resorted to making teas out of local ingredients. It, so this is where we see um, that herbal teas are starting to uh, come into play here. So the uh, colonist ladies would make what they called liberty teas. They were avoiding buying um, the British teas from, from uh, Asia and making their own teas. And a lot of times they would uh, make them out of chamomile or lavender, rose, mint, could be sassafras, fruits like raspberry, apple, blueberry, strawberry, uh, wild bergamot, and New Jersey tea. And we're gonna talk about a couple of these plants here in a minute. Okay, now from there, herbal tea really didn't take off that much. I mean, I don't think it was as, it certainly was not as uh, popular as a black tea from China or India. Um, and certainly coffee was probably a lot more, is a lot more popular than herbal teas. But we had this company called Celestial Seasonings that uh, started up in the 70s uh, and they were marketing these herbal teas. They finally broke $1 million in sales in 1975 and in the 1980s herbal teas became much more popular. But still, uh, herbal teas are more popular in Europe than they he are here in America. So that's some of the history of tea drinking. And I just thought it was kind of fun and I'd share that with you. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to grow the herbs that you would use in an herbal tea and also then how to, to make those herbal teas. So in general, uh, most herbs like to grow in full sun well-drained soils. You don't need to fertilize them very much, if at all. And I mean, there are a few herbs such as in, those in the mint family, lemon balm and mint, uh, spearmint, peppermint, they, they do okay in part sun, but most other ones, um, they like to have full sun. And it's always important to put the right plant in the right place so that it ends up uh, being happy where it's growing, it'll be healthier, grow better. You won't have to use as many insecticides or fungicides or as much fertilizer. So put the right plant in the right place. So do a little research on your herb plants that you want to plant and see what kind of conditions they need specifically and find those conditions in your yard. Um, or on, you can grow things in containers if you don't have a yard. And uh, I do that a lot here where I live. I have a bunch of herb containers on my back porch and I can just step out there and gather my herbs while I'm cooking. You can also grow your herbs in raised beds or of course in grounds. So, and I also have some in actually in a hanging basket on the back porch. I got um, some dill in a hanging basket. So there's all kinds of ways in which you can grow your herbs. Um, another thing you need to be uh, familiar with is whether or not the herb you want to grow is an annual or a perennial. So if it's an annual, it's only going to um, live for one year. It completes its life cycle within one growing season. So those plants you are not going to be able to bring inside and overwinter because they're, they're just, they're going to die because that's their life cycle. I mean, you could leave them outside, but they will still die. Uh, an example of that would be cilantro. Cilantro uh, only is an annual, and I find actually the best way to grow cilantro is to let it go to seed and in the fall, and then it actually will start to grow plants before you go into winter, and those plants will overwinter and then start growing again in the spring, and you'll actually get um, you'll have cilantro available for a much longer time before it, it bolts because it doesn't really stick around for very long and you'll get larger plants. So that's an example of an annual, um, how I would treat that. And I do live in uh, zone five. Okay, so many of the other herbs are perennials, which means they come back every year. Now, whether or not they're gonna come back um, where you live depends on their hardiness zones. And you can Google um, your hardiness zone 
and find out what it is. Uh, just put in hardiness zones and the city and state where you live and it will give you the hardiness zone. But um, where I live here in zone five, uh, I can get some things to overwinter such as I had oregano overwinter and my mints, lemon balm um, and chives, they all come back. Now, for other things that are more tender, like um, sometimes, T-H-Y-M-E-S, um, and rosemary will not overwinter here. So if I want to keep them over, over the winter, I have to bring them indoors, and you will need to have a, a spot with bright light. Um, and it's probably even better to have artificial light so that you can make sure that your plant is getting what it needs to survive the winter. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about harvesting herbs. What's the best way to do that? So uh, the essential oils in the plant are what give it its flavor, its aroma, and also its medicinal properties. All of the um, beneficial chemicals that are in that plant are concentrated in the, the oils. So when you harvest it, you wanna do it when the oils are at the peak of concentration. You wanna do that before flowering and in the morning. Now, if you want to collect the flowers like you would do for chamomile, then of course that doesn't apply. But um, it's best to uh, collect your plants in the morning before the, the hot sun hits them and the oils become volatilized and leave the plant. And you also want to make sure that when you collect those, those plants that the dew has dried on it. So you don't want to bring in wet leaves um, because that um, may lead to growing of mold or other kinds of fungus. So it's better if your plants are dry when you bring them inside. Now, you don't have to worry about cutting back herbs. They actually do better uh, when you cut them back. Um, you, they will become bushier and it also prolongs the time before they go to flower. Now, you can cut annuals back by 50% because they're quick growers or if you have perennials, you can cut them back to about 30%. Okay, for drying herbs, the way I usually do it is I collect them outside and I bring them in and I tie them upside down and hang them in a, a warm, dry place that's out of direct sunlight. You also wanna have good air circulation. This will help the plants to dry without uh, growing any kind of um, mold or fungus on them. Some other ways that you can dry herbs are to place them in a dehydrator, and you can follow directions on your dehydrator for that. You could try and dry them in an oven. The oven needs to be at 90 degrees with the, the door halfway open. You would spread out your leaves or seeds or bark or whatever it is on a cookie sheet and put them in the, in the oven and you'll need to turn them occasionally uh, until they are dry. So check on them often so that you're not over drying them. You don't wanna lose more essential oils than is necessary. Another way to dry herbs is to use the microwave and you can do that by placing your herbs uh, spread out on a paper towel and you can Cook them at low, on low power for like 60 seconds at a time till the, to they feel dry. Keep an eye on them. And then you're gonna need to uh, let them sit out for another 24 to 48 hours just to make sure all of the um, <clears throat> moisture is out of them. Okay, if you wanna try and collect seeds and you're hanging them upside down, you don't want to lose your seeds and have them all drop onto the floor or wherever. So it's a good idea to um, put a, paper bag or plastic, well, now probably paper bag would be better, put it around your plants while they're drying um, so that you don't lose a seed. So as they fall out of your plant, they're collected at the bottom of the paper bag. So what's the best way to store herbs? Well, you first of all, you gotta make real sure that your seeds, roots, leaves, and flowers are completely dry because we don't want any kind of mold or fungus to grow on, um, on your dried herbs. And I see someone ask if you, do you rinse the herbs before drying them? If you want to clean them off, you can do that before drying them. Um, 
just make sure that uh, I would pat them dry with paper towels or towels to make sure you get them as dry as possible uh, before you hung them upside down. Now, of course, if you're gonna put them in the oven to dry them that way, then it's not gonna be as important as far as drying them off. Okay, so once your herbs are dried, um, you wanna store the whole herb, not chopped up or ground up in sealed containers, airtight containers. And um, you can freeze fresh herbs for use in cooking. I do that a lot with um, dill. I just you take the, the plant and throw it in a freezer bag and put it in the freezer and I get out what I need for my recipes and it really retains the flavor very well. Better than it for a dried herb, I think. And you also want to store your herbs in a dark place. You don't want them to be in direct sunlight because that will break them down. Um, they will become less flavorful because they're going to be losing some of those essential oils as they break down. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up is when you collect your herbs, you should uh, make sure that you're not using plants that have been sprayed with pesticides. You want them to be free of chemicals because you are going to be eating them, ingesting them. Also, I, I wouldn't suggest collecting herbs along the side of the road. Uh, you don't know what kind of chemicals have been sprayed by road crews, plus generally soils along sides of roads are, are heavy in metals. Um, so I wouldn't suggest collecting them there either. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So. We'll move on. Just make sure your plants, you're collecting plants um, that don't have chemicals on them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about herbs and their uses and how to make the teas. So herbs are traditionally used for flavoring, for fragrance, and for medicinal properties. And some herbs uh, fill all three of these bills, right? So I'm just going to mention some commonly used herbs to provide flavor for your food. And these are ones that are going to commonly be found in your kitchen. We have anise and basil, bay, bee balm, calendula, chamomile, chives, cilantro, coriander, dill, fennel, lemongrass, marjoram, mints, oregano, parsley, rosemary, sage, tarragon, thyme, winter savory. So I, I imagine most of you are pretty familiar with those because they're pretty common things to have in your kitchen, um, except maybe not calendula or bee balm, but um, I use most of these in my cooking. And these can make some really, really nice teas. Okay, and then there are those herbs which are used for medicinal properties. We have angelica, bone set, Calendula, chamomile, comfrey, dandelion, echinacea, elecampane, feverfew, fennel, ginseng, whorehound, lavender, lemon balm, marshmallow, mints, parsley, thyme, valerian, yarrow, woodruff, and wormwood. Um, and I also want to note that when the colonists came over here from Europe, they brought most of these plants with them. And many of them have naturalized in our landscapes, um, like dandelion, obviously, comfrey. We see feverfew and uh, lemon balm and mints, and they're just in yarrow. They are, uh, we find them throughout our landscapes. And it's because the colonists brought them for medicinal purposes, for cooking with, and also for their fragrance. So some of the ones that traditionally are used for fragrance or for aromatherapy, you might want to say nowadays, are chamomile, artemisia, bee balm, eucalyptus, scented geraniums. I have a rose scented geranium that's really neat. Lavender, lemon balm, lemon verbena, mints, sage, sweet woodruff, thyme, and wormwood. That list, of course, is not exhaustive, but those are that's to give you an idea of what um, what's out there, some of what's out there. Okay, so at this point, I would be taking you on a tour of my demonstration garden. So I'm just going to show you a few, a few of the plants that we have 
in our demonstration garden and what kind of medicinal properties they have or how you would use them in a tea. Now, when I talk about the medicinal properties, this is, you know, historically what these plants have been used for. So I'm just referring to these things in a historical sense. I'm in no way trying to give you any kind of medical advice. Um, before you start using any kind of uh, herb, you should check with your doctor. Because um, a lot of times um, you, you'd be surprised, but the compounds in these plants can actually interfere with medications um, or you might end, find out that you're allergic to them or um, whatever. So you have to be careful when using these plants. Okay, so uh, one of the first plants I'd be proud to show you is my New Jersey tea shrub. Now you can see it's got these nice little white flowers. This shrub was actually used by the colonists during the Revolutionary War. They would use this as a substitute for the British tea. And it is the uh, American plant that is the most similar in flavor to um, an Asian black tea, a Camellia sinensis. And I've tried this one, I've made it for guests, and uh, it really is pretty good. I do enjoy it. And um, as far as medicinal properties, uh, it's thought to um, serve as, if you use the roots, it's thought to use, uh, work as an expectorant and to treat asthma, bronchitis, and coughs. Okay, next I will show you my chamomile. This is a pretty popular one. I think most people are familiar with this. Um, this herb is purported to have a calming effect. Um, it relieves stress and anxiety. Also, you can make a wash out of it and use it for uh, minor skin problems, such as cuts, bruises, and burns. It's also said to have antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory properties. However, if you tend to get allergies in the spring or fall, um, might watch out when you're using this plant because you might find that you're allergic to it as well. So just uh, be aware of that. Uh, feverfew. Now this is a really cool plant, um, probably less well known. Uh, but this one is, um, has been shown to actually help with migraine headaches. And it's also said to help relieve allergies. It can help treat fevers, rheumatoid arthritis, stomach ache, and tooth ache. Now, as you're looking at these two plants, they do actually look pretty similar. Uh, they have these like daisy-like flowers. But the chamomile, uh, this is a German chamomile, it gets to be about, I guess, about three feet tall, and the, the leaves on it are very uh, uh, thin, feathery. Um, anybody ever see an asparagus fern, you know, after it goes to, to, uh, to flower and to seed? Uh, the leaves look kind of like that. They're really uh, thin and lacy-like. Now, the, with the fever few, the leaves on that look more like fern leaves, okay, much thicker there. Okay, now we come to the lemon balm. And as you notice, I've got it growing in a pot. And that's one thing I wanna mention about some herbs. Some herbs can be invasive, especially those in the mint family. So oregano, uh, lemon balm, any kind of mint, they are aggressive in your garden. So in order to keep them from taking over, you may want to plant them in pots so you can kind of help um, prevent them from becoming a botanical bully in your garden. Lemon balm um, is also supposed to have a calming or soothing effect. Some people just know it as balm. It helps to reduce stress and anxiety, promote sleep, improve your appetite, can help ease pain, and, di and discomfort from indigestion, relieves gas and bloating. Uh, so this is, makes a nice, I think it makes a nice base for just about any tea. It has a nice lemony flavor. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now we come to, to marshmallow, and this is more of a uh, medicinal plant. And it, what you can use from this plant would be the leaf, the flower, and the root. Um, and it's a, a mucilaginous plant. So it um, creates this kind of thick, gooey substance it's called mucilage. 
And in that are contained uh, many kinds of antioxidants. And research suggests that it works by um, helping to coat your skin or throat or digestive tract, and, and it helps to uh, relieve dry coughs or protect against stomach ulcers and also can help uh, relieve you of skin irritations. Okay, next on the list is whorehound. You may have heard of that one. That used to be a popular ingredient in cough drops. Um, that is supposed to help relieve the symptoms associated with coughs, colds, and bronchitis. Elecampane is another one of these plants brought over by the colonists. This is actually a really huge plant. Um, it's about three feet wide and about five feet tall. So it takes up a lot of space in your garden. <clears throat> and uh, this plant has uses in treating lung problems such as asthma, bronchitis, whooping cough. It can act as an expectorant to loosen phlegm. It can also help to soothe your stomach and um, help with nausea and gas and diarrhea. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's also a, a vermifuge, which means that it can help to expel worms. Okay, now we come to calendula. This plant has a lot of uses. You can eat the flowers. Um, you can dry the flowers and grind them up and use them for a food dye in place of saffron. You can also use it, the flowers, uh, for a fiber dye if you want to dye wool or some other natu natural fibers. It's purported to have antifungal and antibacterial properties. Traditionally, it's been used to help relieve skin problems. Um, <clears throat> such as rash, eczema, minor burns, sunburns, and scrapes. Now we have wild bergamot. This is Monarda fistulosa. Um, you may also be familiar with the term bee balm. Bee balm is Monarda didyma. Monarda didyma has the bright red flowers. The um, wild bergamot, bergamot, the Monarda fistula, when you see it growing out in nature, it tends to be uh, a lavender color, maybe pinkish or even whitish. This is a cultivated one, so it's got a little darker pink color. But wild bergamot has a really nice flavor. Um, it reminds me, or you know, the flavor that you have in Earl Grey tea. And some of the, the properties that it has is that it uh, has antimicrobial activity. It is also soothing and calming, can help reduce stress. Um, it also has been used to treat colds, indigestion, bloating, and nausea. And finally, come to purple coneflower. I think this has probably got to be one of my favorite plants. It's native to North America. The Native Americans used to use this uh, for a lot of medicinal things. And one interesting story I read is that the people would take the flowers and they would chew on them and it would actually numb their, it would numb your mouth, numbs your tongue. And so they would use that if they had a toothache, um, they had some kind of ulcer or pain, some kind of pain in their mouth, and it would help to reduce that, that pain. And, um, but after a lot of research, they found that this plant really has, does have some excellent medicinal properties. Uh, it helps to stimulate the body's immune system by increasing the number and acti activity of white blood cells and lymphocytes. So it helps, helps to fight off um, viruses, bacteria, and uh, even tumor cells. So this is an amazing plant. So it, it also helps to facilitate wound healing. Okay. Now, if you're gonna design a, a tea garden, uh, you're gonna wanna think about, you know, what kind of herbs are most important to you, what you wanna be making tea with or use in cooking or ones for medicinal properties. And so, you consider all that in your design and also you wanna make, you, there are different ways to do it. So you could group your plants by uh, the similar 
environmental um, needs that it has, you know, how much light does it need or moisture and nutrient requirements. So you want to put like plants with like plants, or you could group the plants according to their medicinal properties. Um, you could say, oh, well, here is my pain relief garden, and that would be pretty neat. Or you could um, just make a little kitchen garden close to your uh, house so that you can go out there and gather your herbs quickly and easily. Um, or you could place them in pots like I do right out on your back porch so you have easy access to them. And this is uh, a picture of um, a garden that was developed at, at the Washington County Ag Center, I believe by their master gardeners there. It's a nervous system themed herb garden. And in that you will find St. John's wort, chamomile, skullcap, valerium, and different kinds of balm. So that's one way where you could do the garden where it's actually themed according to a particular uh, health issue. And this is a picture of my back porch and all those pots have got herbs in them. I have basil and thyme and oregano and sage and parsley and I've got some spinach growing up on that uh, rail box there, deck rail. And you'll see I have some, also have some flowers in the pots with it too. That's sweet alyssum. So you can make your herb pots uh, attractive. You can put some flowers in there too. Okay, we're gonna talk about then the difference between teas, infusions, decoctions, and um, tinctures. Just because I think that um, a lot of people are interested in that and they're not really sure what, what all the differences, differences are. So we're gonna first talk about teas and infusions. So teas and infusions are mostly made from the leaves, petals, and flowers of herbs. And in order to make your tea, you're gonna collect your uh, plant material and you wanna add boiling water to those herbs and steep for five to 10 minutes. Now, the longer that you let it steep, uh, the stronger it's gonna taste, the more uh, essential oils you're extracting from the plant. And these are all gonna be water soluble um, essential oils, minerals, vitamins, flavonoids, okay? And with some things like mints, if you uh, steep them too long, then you can actually uh, release uh, terpenes and it will not, it'll be very bitter and won't really taste that good. So you have to do a little bit of experimenting, you know, when you're making your teas, uh, or what is the, the optimum amount of time for steeping. When you're making your, your teas, we generally say you wanna use one teaspoon of dried herb per one cup of boiling water, or three teaspoons of the fresh herb per one cup of boiling water. Okay, so infusions are a little bit different. They are only different in the amount of time in which you are steeping your herbs in, in the boiling water. So for infusions, you steep your plant material for 15 to 30 minutes. And this will help to extract even more medicinal type uh, compounds from the plants. Decoctions. Now, these are teas that are made from seeds, roots, and bark. And because they're, these are tough materials, uh, it's more difficult to release these chemicals from the plant material. So you have to simmer them in boiling water uh, for five to 10 minutes and for seeds or up to 20 minutes for roots and bark. So basically the, the difference with this is you're, you're simmering on a pot on the stove instead of just adding boiling water and letting it steep. So to make a decoction, you would wanna use one tablespoon of seeds per two cups of boiling water or one teaspoon of dried roots per two cups of boiling water. I remember my father um, making me some sassafras tea. He bought the, the dried roots at a little country store and I remember him throwing some in a little um, saucepan with some water covering it and then you know simmering it for a while. And I just remembered, I love that tea. That was the best taste in tea. So from this 
from that day on, I just have a soft spot in my heart for sassafras tea. It's a really nice flavor. Okay, tinctures. Now tinctures, this has nothing to do with tea. This is more on the medicinal side of uh, using herbs. And I just included this just for your information. I think it's a fun topic uh, if you wanna try these kinds of things out. But, but once, once again, um, this is not any kind of um, advice, medical advice, I'm just giving you some background on uh, what a tincture is and how to make one. So herbs uh, are infused into alcohol in a tincture. This is ethyl alcohol, what, the kind of alcohol that you would drink. And the reason why it's put into alcohol is because the alcohol is able to extract many more of those beneficial compounds, such as alkaloids, flavonoids, minerals, and vitamins, vitamins than you can with water, because not everything is soluble in water. But some of these other compounds are soluble in alcohol, and so that's how you're able to extract that. Um, so, and well, the other good thing about tinctures is that they can be ex, uh, stored for an extended period of time. And um, it is also interesting if you start doing some research into this that different herbs need different alcohol concentrations in order to extract their medicinal compounds. And um, I have included a, a link to a, um, a website for a college that teaches about herbal medicine. It's, it's really pretty neat, it's accredited. Um, you can check that out if you like. And they also have this particular link um, takes you to a page that tells you what alcohol concentration you need for which herb. So um, that's pretty cool. I uh, one time I decided just to to you know do an experiment, and I thought I would make a tincture out of echinacea. So I got I dug up an entire echinacea plant because all parts of that are used in making a tincture, and I chopped it up. Of course, washed it off first, and then chopped it up, and then put it in uh, a quart jar of uh, vodka. But it was funny because I, I looked up, you know, what was the alcohol concentration you need for that? And it's 60%. So that means you need 120 proof to, to make this tincture. And I don't frequent uh, liquor stores very often, but I went into this one local liquor store and I walked in there and I was looking bewildered, didn't know where to find anything. And um, the clerk came over to me and says, can I help you, ma'am? And I said, I need something with 120 proof. And he just looked at me like I was a crazy lady or something. <laughs> but honestly, it was hard to find something that was 120 proof. Um, uh, grain alcohol would be 120 proof. There aren't too many vodkas um, or gins, whiskeys out there that are 120, but they exist. Um, okay, so that's my little story about tinctures. Um, your basic tincture recipe is that uh, the base liquid is measured in fluid ounces while the herbs are is measured by dry weight dry ounces okay and a general ratio of liquid to plant material is five parts alcohol to one part dried material and uh, two to one if you're using fresh or frozen material now there are other carriers you can uh, but we're only going to focus on alcohol today all right, so the material that you're gonna use should be, of course, clean and should be finely chopped. And you can research different recipes, but generally you uh, let them sit in the alcohol, alcohol for two to eight weeks. And then you're gonna strain out all that plant material. And you then need to store your tincture in a tightly sealed jar out of, out of sunlight. It, and is sometimes, or well, it's uh, suggested that if you can, you know, use a color, colored glass, like a, a brown glass or blue grass or whatever, so that glass so that um, you are blocking out UV rays from getting to your, your tincture and possibly breaking down the, the compounds that are in there. Now, this is not drunk like a tea. When you take this, you are taking a dropper full at a time, so not even a teaspoonful, okay? And um, so, that's information on making a basic tincture.
Now, at this part of the program, and then we would have some fun and go and make some actual tea. And you can see a picture here of one of my programs where um, we have some ladies and one gentleman and they're uh, trying some of the teas that we had just made. So uh, I'm gonna show you some tea recipes that I have used in the past that have turned out pretty well. But like I say, um, this is kind of a trial and error thing. You decide, everybody's you know, taste buds are different. And um, so what tastes good to one person may not to another. So you're just gonna have to play around with the proportions. And also it may be a good idea to start with a tea, an herbal tea that only has one ingredient, just so um, then you can be sure if you have any kind of reaction, you know which you know, herb you were having a reaction to if you only have one in there. Okay. Hey, Sherry, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. Um, we had a couple of questions that came in. Um, one person was interested in walking through the exact process of how to make tea. So can you talk about just, the, it's usually with dried plants. You've kind of already hit on it some, but just. Um. Yeah, sure. So um, if I was going to make this uh, lavender lemon balm mint tea, then I would go out and uh, collect the lavender flowers. If I didn't have fresh lavender flowers, then maybe I would have bought these lavender flower buds um, from some kind of an herbal store and they would be dried. Okay, so remember um, we use one third of the amount of your herb if it's dry, okay? And if I wanted lemon balm, I have lemon balm growing in my garden. So I would just go out and I would collect the lemon balm leaves from there, wash, rinse them off, make sure they're clean. And also I have chocolate mint, which I grow and I would go and collect some of that. And then <clears throat> I would take the leaves and I just, I had some culinary scissors, which I can use to cut the, the leaves up with, or you could uh, get out a chef's knife and you could chop them on a cutting board, okay? And my teapot holds five cups, so I measured this, you know, ahead of time to know how many cups I could get out of it. And that, remember we said that it was three teaspoons of fresh herb per one cup of boiling water. So for a five cup pot, then I would need approximately 15 teaspoons of herbs if they're fresh, okay? So that's how I figure how to make the tea. And so for this recipe, I would chop up the, the lavender flowers and if they're fresh, I would use five teaspoons of that. If not, I might only use one or two if it's dried. And then with the lemon balm leaves, I would take then seven teaspoons of that and three teaspoons of my chopped mint. Mint's pretty strong in flavor. Um, so it may overpower the lavender there. So then you just take all of that plant material, I put it in my teapot and then I pour boiling water into the teapot. And it's nice if you have a teapot that has a strainer built into it uh, so that when you pour it out, then it strains out all that plant material. But I didn't have one like that. So then as I would pour the, the tea out of the pot after letting it sit for five minutes, um, I would pour it through a strainer into the, the teacup, okay? Uh, so that's, that's the nitty gritty of how you would make a tea. And like I said, you can, um, you know, ch you know, work, you change up the, the proportions of these different herbs as you're making the tea. Um, let's see, did that answer the question all right? Any other questions? Yeah, I think that was, that's good. If they have other questions, please feel free to, to enter them in the chat. Um, I had a few more about specific. Huh? I had a few more about specific plants. Do you wanna, oh, okay. do all right, you wanna well, let's go ahead through the rest of it? Yeah, I'll, we'll finish this and then see if we can answer the questions about the specific plants. So we'll just go over these recipes. And uh, yes, we will send a PDF out to you uh, through, you know, to your email. And so you'll have these recipes as long as the rest, as well as the rest of the presentation. Okay, so the other 
Uh, tea that I like to make is a, a chamomile lemon balm hibiscus tea. Now the hibiscus is from uh, dried hibiscus flowers and it will make the, the tea very red and it's also you know, kind of sour. It's a, it's a good source of, of vitamin C. So um, in that one, the ratio was seven teaspoon of chamomile flowers that were you know, freshly collected two teaspoons of the dried hibiscus flowers, seven teaspoons of chopped fresh lemon balm leaves. Okay, and then you pour your boiling water into the pot with all that uh, plant material and let it steep for about five minutes before you strain and serve. And um, I actually really like the flavor of the uh, hibiscus. And it, it probably does um, overwhelm the chamomile a little bit, so you might wanna you know, play around with that ratio a little bit. Okay, so here's a, a tea with just a single ingredient. You can use any kind of a mint, your favorite kind of mint, could be peppermint, chocolate mint, apple mint, whatever you like. Um, so basically, I just collected it fresh from the garden. And this is for a, a pot of a tea, a whole teapot, which would be five cups, and used about 15 teaspoons of chopped fresh chocolate mint leaves. Um, It'd be, a lot, it'd be a lot easier for if I had said like one cup of, of chopped fresh chocolate mint leaves, which you can play around with that, you know, see what 15 teaspoons turns out to be um, volume wise and just make life easier on yourself as far as your recipe goes. But just wanted to enforce the idea of um, three teaspoons of herbs per cup that you're making. Okay. All right. The next one is the New Jersey tea. And uh, I took fresh New Jersey tea leaves off of the shrub. Um, and you could do that. You would do 15 teaspoons if they were fresh. If they are dried, then you would do five teaspoons. Uh, and you would crush those leaves up and put them in the pot. Pour that boiling water in there and steep it for five minutes or more, um, maybe up to 10, and then strain and serve. And I really do like the way this one tastes. Um, it, it tastes pretty familiar, pretty familiar tea, so pretty good. All right, so now I guess Ashley, you and I can uh, work on answering some questions here. Okay. Yeah, so I had a couple of questions specifically about uh, stinging nettles and using them for tea. Do you want, do you have okay, any I've, information about that? No, I mean, I've never done that. Um, I've eaten stinging nettle as a, a pot herb. You know, you cook it like spinach and it tastes great. Um, but no, I haven't used it in a tea. I know that when you cook it to eat it, you, um, you boil it in some water and then you throw that water out and you boil it again. So you do have to do a change of water um, with it. So I'm not really sure if you would need to do that with the tea. I'd have to have to do some research on that. So. Sorry, I can't give you a, a definitive answer there. Well, that's okay. We can, um, if you have specific questions about that and you want to email us, I'll stick our email addresses in here um, for anybody. I know we had a couple questions. Uh, the other question I had was um, that I didn't know the answer to, unfortunately, was is all St. John's wort edible, the different cultivars, do you know? Or is it just a specific cultivar? Um. I don't know the answer to that one either. I'd have to do some research. I tend to think that it would be any St. John's wort um, because it was brought over here from, from Europe. And so um, the ones that we have now are cultivars from those, those earlier plants. But you know, I'd have to do some research on that. I don't really know for sure. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought too. So again, if you ask the question about St. John's wort um, and you want to follow up with us via the an email, we can try to get you some specific specifics about that one. All right, I think Sherry, that's pretty much, I mean, we've had a few other questions coming in. Um, one about hibiscus, about if you can use the calyx or just the or just the flower petals. And I wasn't sure about that one either, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, I, bought, I bought mine from a, a tea place. So um, yeah, I didn't do the collecting myself. So I'm not really sure exactly which parts they collected. But did we have a couple of polling questions? 
Yes, yes. I will go ahead and stick those polling questions up as we uh, continue to monitor the chat. Please go ahead and answer these if you have a minute. Okay. Looks like we've got just about everybody has responded there. So it looks like that just about everybody agrees that uh, they intend to grow more herbs. And I think that's great. I really, I just really love working with herbs. I know uh, Ashley does too. She has a really great presentation on growing and using herbs. And looks like just about everyone agrees, whether it's agree or strongly agrees, that they intend to experiment with making their own herbal teas. I think, I think you'll have fun. It's um, a nice summer um, activity. Also in the winter, if you've got your dried plant materials, you can try that, try this in the winter as well, so. All right, well, I think it was very good. Thank you, Sherry, for presenting. That was wonderful information. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we will be sending out the link to the recording for this presentation as well as the handouts later this week. Um, we just had a question come in about bee balm specifically. Uh, Sherry, you can still use bee balm, the red ones, correct? Yes, yes. They, but the, the bee balm or the, um, the wild bergamot, they have very similar characteristics. So I just wanted to point them out because um, you know, sometimes people use the terms interchangeably, but they, they are actually different species. The, the red one is um, Monarda didyma, and then the wild one, well, the red one's wild too, but the um, wild bergamot is usually a pink or purplish color. It's um, Monarda fistulosa. So. <coughs> Okay, well, if we missed anybody in the questions, I know we're still getting some questions about the hibiscus. So if you have a specific question about hibiscus, please go ahead and um, send us an email. Again, I'll stick our emails in here. We'll have to look that one up. We're not 100% sure about that. Um, right. So I'll stick our emails in here. So please feel free to follow up with us on that question. Um, we had one question here. Can you use Monarda leaves if they have mildew? And I would say probably not. If they have any type of fungus on them, I would stay away from that. Yeah, just to be safe. Um, I mean, you certainly wouldn't want to try and dry it and keep it because that's, it won't do well. Um, plus, you know, infect everything else that you're trying to, to dry. So, no, I wouldn't use it. Very good. All right. Well, I think with that, Sherry, great job. Thank you all for um, hanging out with us a little bit this afternoon and learning about teas. We are going to go ahead and stop the recording and